Um, my name is Imran Belodia. Um, I'm uh, the director of the Southern Centre for Inequalities uh, Studies and also the pro vice chancellor at Wits University. It's my uh, kind of great pleasure to uh, to uh, to kind of start the proceedings for our 2023 uh, kind of inequality uh, lecture at Wits University. So the inequality uh, lecture that we have at the center and at the universities were one of our flagship events. And we, uh, we're kind of extremely pleased to have Professor Branko Milanovic uh, do, the, do the lecture this year. Uh, we had hoped initially to have, uh, to have Professor Milanovic Lanovich here at Wits University, and for us to combine to combine the lecture with him spending some time at all South African universities who are who are doing work in this area. But unfortunately, uh, uh, because of the, of the demands on his program, we've had to do the lecture uh, uh, this year online. Uh, better to have uh, uh, kind of Branko online than to not have him at all. And we're hoping that we will be, be kind of able to have him in South Africa soon. So he's going to be uh, talking on an extremely important uh, 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 topic, which has been uh, kind of a, 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 a kind of really key, key point in his research. And it's on uh, kind of recent trends in global income distribution in their, um, and, their, um, and their political implications. I'm going to pop, pass on to our, DV, um, to our DVC research, uh, Prof. Lynn um, Morris, who is going to say a few words to uh, uh, kind of introduce this evening's lecture and also for her for her to officially introduce Camp uh, our speaker tonight. So much, Imran, um, and welcome everybody. Um, there are over 150, I think, online. Um, so wonderful that uh, uh, that you're all joining us um, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. Um, but also just to thank uh, Imran and the team um, at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies, which is one of our leading research entities at WITS, and we're very proud um, that, uh, that, that we have such an, an entity and is able to attract such high caliber um, experts to come and address these really uh, critical questions. So as Imran said, you know, the point of this lecture is to highlight these very important issues. And this is the fifth um, in the series. Uh, I think many of you will recall we had uh, a number of uh, excellent speakers in, in previous years, including Shahara Ravazi from the ILO, Winnie Bianyama from UNAIDS, uh, Professor Ravi Kanbur, um, and then the first speaker was Professor Ashwini Deshpande uh, from India. So it's really um, developing a, a very nice um, pedigree of, of top, of top uh, speakers from, from around the globe. Um, and, you know, it's really important that we here in South Africa focus on, on this issue because we all know that inequality in South Africa has long been recognized as one of the most striking features of our society and it remains inequality remains the highest in the world in, in, in this country and in fact according to the most recent data um, South Africa has the highest uh, Gini coefficient which is the measure of, of income inequality of around 0.67 um, and clearly that's something that uh, we're all very concerned about and something that we need to be understanding more and doing something about but you know, while inequality is a global phenomenon, it's also important to remember that the global South faces unprecedented levels of poverty and inequality because we don't have the safety nets of the various Northern welfare states. So we do have um, you know, that extra burden. Um, but we're also living at a time on intersecting poly crises and inequality has been identified as both a key root cause and a result of these crises. Um, and just to say, you know, WITS has been um, playing a leading role in this area and in fact recently hosted the release of the UNR ISD um, flagship report, the 2022 report, which detailed the extent to which inequality is both a driver 
and an amplifier of socioeconomic ills. And the report finds that inequalities and crises reinforce and compound each other, leading to extreme disparity, vulnerability, and unsustainability, and proposes the creation of a new eco-social contract. And we also know that high levels of inequality are detrimental to society and the economy, as inequality correlates with various social problems, such as health, mortality rates, and crime. Essentially, a high level of inequality indicates that a large segment of the society is excluded from economic opportunity, limiting individual outcomes, and at the aggregate, the performance of the economy and the fulfillment of society. So in his keynote address, Professor Milanovic will look at the evolution of inequality in the last two centuries, and in particular, global inequality in the last 30 years. He'll also discuss possible future evolution of global inequality in which the roles of India and large African countries will become increasingly important and determine what happens to inequality in this century and possibly the next. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, Professor <clears throat> Milanovic. He's, he is a, a research professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, also known as CUNY, uh, where he's also a senior scholar at the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. He's also a visiting professor at the Institute for International Inequalities at the London School of Economics. Milanovic's main area of work is income inequality in individual countries and globally, including in pre-industrial societies. And he's published articles, many articles on these topics in the Economic Journal, the Review of Economics and Statistics, Nature, and the Journal of Economic Literature, amongst many others. He's also published a number of books. He's the author of Global Inequality, a new approach for the age of globalization in 2016. And for that, he received the Bruno Kreitsky Prize and the Hans Matthofer Prize in 2017 and 2018, respectively. Branko was awarded jointly with Mariana Mazzucato the 2018 Leontief Prize for advancing the frontiers of economic knowledge. And his most recent book, Capitalism Alone, was published in 2019 and was translated into 15 languages. So it really gives me great pleasure uh, to invite uh, uh, Branko to, to address us, and we really look forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, first, to thank you for this invitation, which is both a pleasure and an honor. And to some extent, to apologize that I have to do it uh, online, because I think it would have been much better to be there in person. I do, however, hope that uh, possibly next year, it would uh, actually happen. I've got the newest two presentations in, in uh, online. I see that there is a very good attendance. So there is something to be said in favor of that, but I think they cannot fully uh, replicate or replace in-person presentations. Having said that, let me try first to share my slides. Uh, and then hopefully to go over the presentation. Uh, I will be speaking for about 35 to 40 minutes. I want to let you know that in advance. So if you become a little bit impatient, you know the, the end is near. And I would, uh, um, the, the slides actually exist. I mean, I, I send them so they would be there. You can actually access them, but I will not cover all of them simply because they are simply too many. Well, this is, it starts as a very sort of a general uh, view of what happened to global inequality over the last 200 years. I will be very brief on this because obviously that can take a whole lecture just sort of explaining the methodological choices and the data issue that we had in working on that. I, I have, this is a nice quote from Fernand Brodel, essentially saying that the structural realities are very slow to take place and also to fade away. And this is indeed what we find in, not only in global inequality, we find it in inequality herself, I, in itself. I read uh, Professor um, Volodya's paper like recently that was published in a South African journal. And indeed with now, uh, as Lynn said, with high, probably South Africa having one of the highest inequalities, it is not very easy even if the policies were different, it's not easy to change things and to reduce inequality. So 
Uh, I would, when I show you in a minute the, the shape of global inequality over the last two centuries, I have to say that it relies for the period from 1820 to the 1980s uh, on a seminal work by uh, Francois Bourguignon and Christian Morisson, who actually did that originally in the early 2000s. And uh, that work has been somewhat updated by myself using the new GDP data for the historical period. Uh, the results are basically the same either way, but what really is important to realize is the following. If we start with uh, an attempt to estimate global inequality, which I forgot to define, is, is inequality between world citizens. So you treat the entire world in those days, you know, post-Napoleonic uh, Wars, we are talking a little over 1 billion people. Nowadays, we are talking about 8 billion people. Technically, you take incomes of all of them, take them in local currency, Convert, convert them into so-called PPP dollars, which in principle give you the same purchasing power everywhere. So that, for example, uh, incomes that are received in South Africa or India or Brazil or uh, countries that have lower price level than the US, US is used as a numeraire, these incomes are boosted up so that actually you do acknowledge the fact that maybe if you have to buy you know, uh, rice and, and uh, tea, in India, it doesn't go, going to cost as much as in Norway. Uh, so that's how it is in principle done. Now, obviously we don't have data for 8 billion people. We use for the more recent period, a uh, household surveys that are nationally representative uh, for about, from, from about 130 countries. I have to actually say that South Africa has been very good in that respect. I'm also involved with Luxembourg Income Study, which receives all this service with South Africa. We have never had problems, and actually the, the, the delivery of the data is quite good. Uh, South African problem, as you know, is high inequality, but not as much the, the data provision. So how does global inequality look when you look at this kind of really very broad uh, picture? It actually goes up throughout the, the whole 19th century. It is driven by increasing gaps between the countries in the North, essentially North and Western Europe and North America, and stagnant or even declining incomes in uh, India and China. Now at that time, Africa doesn't play that much of a role. Africa is poor, but it doesn't get poorer than it was and it's relatively small in terms of population. I will come at the end of my talk to a point that was mentioned before, really increasing importance in Africa now and actually yet more increasing importance in the rest of the, of the of this century. Now, the second period is the period of after World War II and US dominance when you have essentially the world divided into three wars. The, the first world of developed and rich capitalist countries, the second world of socialist countries with lower income, and the third world that basically includes Asia and Africa, and to some extent, most of Latin America. So that's the world with extremely high inequality. You see the Gini coefficient here of over 70. So if you were to take uh, South Africa as a representative of the world, to some extent it mimics the world, uh, inequality then was even higher than in, in South Africa, which is not surprising. Obviously, the world includes everybody. But what is interesting is from around the turn of the 21st century, you have a decline, and I have to really emphasize that, a decline in standard measurement of inequality using the Gini coefficient, which is on the vertical axis, and that decline comes as a result predominantly of China, of Chinese growth, but also of India, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and so forth. The basic line here, and I will not talk about that much more because I think it should be intuitive, is that you have very large countries that start the period of the 1980s and onward with being large, of course, in terms of population, and being relatively poor. So what happens in the next 40 years? They, and China is paradigmic case, they simply grow faster 
than the poorest countries and the richest countries. And since that middle becomes more important, they actually reduce global inequality measured by the Gini coefficient. And I will talk about that really in a minute because I would focus on the, on the past 30 years. Now, you can also uh, break this global inequality into two components. The blue, one, the blue component is inequality between countries and the uh, orange component inequalities within countries. Now, without going through all of these individual data points, let me just point out to the general tendencies. In the 19th century, the blue component goes up simply on account of rising gaps between the global south and global north. Let's call, put it in today's terminology. In those days terminology, it was different. It was really the rising differences between essentially uh, uh, countries of Western Europe and North America and India and China, as I said before. But noticed also in that period, the rising uh, uh, orange bar, which indicates increasing income inequality within countries. So you had, and you know, obviously Marx is a perfect example of that, you had rising inequalities within nation states. And on the other hand, you had rising inequalities between nation states. And these two forces were both pushing inequality up. So then you have this very long period of almost like, a, you know, more than 50 years of extremely high inequality where the red bar sh starts shrinking because of the reduction of inequalities in the West, because of communist revolutions in Eastern Europe and previous in the Soviet Union and China that all reduced inequality within countries. And you have a, still a very high level of between country inequality, the, the blue bar. And then what happens in the, in the latest period is the blue bar shrinks on account of the rise of Asia. And the red bar goes up a little bit because of the rising inequalities within countries. So notice now, and this is actually, I think, a very uh, succinct summary of what's happening today, is that you have rising, uh, rising gaps within nation states and diminished gaps between the countries overall. That does not mean that each individual country is behaving exactly like that, but it the blue bar is really uh, determined and the decline in the blue, blue bar is driven by the rise of Asia. To some extent, the rise of Asia is the, like the mirror image of the rise of the West. The rise of the West took place where income differences between countries were very small, and then the rise of the West made income differences between countries large. The rise of Asia is the mirror image because it starts at a position where the differences between countries are, are very large and basically because of, of the rise of the relatively poor continent, it reduces the differences. So the, I think that the, the, the dynamic of what happened, I think is important to keep in mind and not to actually, uh, when we speak of inequality, believe that inequality must increase or is increasing in all the different dimensions. In the, the population weighted between country inequality, it is certainly going down. Uh, and then of course it can be seen also by using GDP data. So I will not go over this graph. The GDP data also are annually available and you do the, the weighting, the weighting by the, country, by the size of the population and they, so they show you more or less the same trends. So this is what they call the now the greatest reshuffle in relative income positions. I have to point out that will, you will show that in the middle in a minute in a minute. But what reshuffle is what I mean by reshuffling is that the top twenty percent of the world, in terms of individual incomes, has essentially been quote unquote occupied by the people from the global north for the last two centuries. What is now happening is that people from Asia, not only because these countries have high growth, but because these countries have also lots of people, are entering into that area. And when they enter, since we are talking about rankings, what happens if somebody who was maybe at the 75th percentile of the global income distribution, 
gets overtaken by somebody who was below him or her. And then that obviously means that you cannot stay at the number 75, you have to go down. And this is this reshuffling in individual positions, which also reflects the reshuffling in economic power and a position uh, between Asia and, uh, and essentially the global north. Uh, so here is an, another example by using GDP. In always, I'm always talking on PPP terms because they are just everything for the purchasing power, as explained before. The China overtook the US, it is well known in 2015. So the graph on the left is, is sort of been used before, but the, the graph on the right is even to some extent more striking, compares the size, and both graphs compare the size of the two economies. In the graph on the right, you compare the size of India versus Germany. And notice that, for example, in 1980s, Germany represented about 7% of the global GDP. India represented less than 3%, or actually produced less than 3% of the global GDP. Uh, the proportions are entirely different now. Uh, India is producing 8% of the global GDP, and Germany is producing 3%. It does not mean that the Germany has declined. As you know, in, in absolute amount, Germany did not decline, but Germany grew much slower than the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is basically determined, I mean, the growth comes from large Asian countries. So that particular feature that you can see in the case of Germany, the decline in the share will be then seen in individual incomes of German citizens whose relative worldwide position has also declined. Now, what did the rise of Asia sort of uh, accomplish, if you will, uh, you can see it kind of nicely on this stylized picture, which shows you uh, density of uh, distributions uh, in three years, 1988, 2008, and 2018. And uh, the 1988 period begins with really lots of population in the world. And again, China and India predominantly uh, at a very low level of income, as you notice that the, the mean of that large peak, the, the point of that large peak is about five or six hundred dollars per year. So we are talking about two dollars per day being the, the first peak. And what happens is that the distribution shifts rightward, which means that incomes uh, increase. So that's what the rightward, uh, rightward shift implies. But on top of that, notice a very important phenomenon which is the rise on the middle. So you, in 1988, you have kind of emptiness in the middle. And I remember when I did my first book on the topic, uh, it was in the early 2000s, it was called the, the, the World's Apart. And it really highlighted that bizarre situation where the, the middle of the global income distribution is kind of empty. And it was empty because you had a very big peak uh, uh, on the left uh, with low, low or with low incomes, uh, again, India, China, lots of Asia. And then you had another smaller peak of very high incomes with Western countries. Well, that has really uh, changed. The shape has significantly changed. And as you can see, this green line looks almost like a log normal distribution. Uh, the the, um, the x-axis is in logs. And it kind of looks like a normal distribution. It's still not a normal distribution. It is still skewed to the right because you have very high incomes at the, at the end. I mean, top 1%, top 2%. But it almost looks like a distribution of an individual country. So that really happened over historically short period of time of 30 years. However, uh, the picture is not only you know, bright. There are the, the large gaps remain. And for example, if you take China out, which of course played a cru crucial role in what you can call the, the relative convergence of incomes, if you take China out and put everybody else, call it periphery, and take the rich world of North America, West, I mean, Europe, uh, Oceania, and uh, Japan as the core, uh, you notice that the distributions of the two are quite different. Relatively few people from the periphery, which means the rest of the world, are 
having incomes that are above the, the median of the core countries, and almost none from the core countries has incomes below the median of the periphery. And the ratio, it's all on PPP terms, the ratio of the medians is A to 2. So one should be very careful. One should be applauding and be happy that I think in principle that we have had a, a sort of the creation of something that I call the global median class, that we have uh, the much more people in the middle, that we have had a very good period of growth over the last pre-COVID. I'm talking about 30 years pre-COVID. On the other hand, the gaps are still enormous and some parts of the world have really not benefited much in terms of income nor in terms of convergence. And if, for example, the convergence between the periphery and the core were to continue at the rate at which happened over the last 30 years, again, excluding China, it would take three centuries for the periphery to have enough population above the income of the current income of the uh, median income in the core. So we would take three centuries for some kind of convergence. So it is really a snail space in some ways. And I think that's why we should keep these two pictures at the same time. Yes, there was a convergence. China played a crucial role, but parts of the world were actually uh, exempt from that. And I think Africa in particular was exempt from that. And of course, when you use uh, a, a market exchange rates instead of PPPs, that gap becomes uh, you know, multiplied uh, and it becomes 22 times. So essentially the gap becomes enormous. You know, the, the, the average income, the median income in the periphery is you know, 122 parts. Like, uh, so it becomes like 4% of the income in the core. That was at the market exchange rates, which of course are not giving you the real purchasing power, which is greater in the periphery than indicated by a market exchange rate, but it is still useful you know, to keep in mind. Um, I would then now move to the more recent period, uh, which is to first characterized by the graph that many of you have seen. This was the so-called elephant chart. I would go very briefly over that because I think it's been discussed and over discussed. It uh, essentially showed during the period of high globalization, it showed very high income growth in the middle of the income distribution. The fact that you have already implicit, you have seen already because it was implicit in the graph that I've shown before. It has shown a low growth of the Western middle classes. That was the point B. And that was of course the political issue in many countries. And finally, at point C, it shows very high growth rates among the top 1%. So this is, uh, I think the, the importance of this graph was a political importance because it became very popular in rich countries, highlighting the fact that the middle classes in those countries have not seen much real growth during the, the period of high globalization. And that of course is in con sort of a, distinction to the very high growth, growth seen, experienced by the top 1% in those countries, and also by very high growth among middle classes in Asia. So that, of course, graph then led you to a political dilemma. Should, if you really in the West want to improve the position of the point B, should you improve it by taxing point C more, or should you improve it by changing globalization as it's happening now to make China grow less so that the point A shrinks down and hopefully point B goes up? Because I think we, one has to see the current uh, attempts of the, of the North to deglobalize precisely in that context, is the context in which the rich countries were not satisfied with the way that globalization worked for their uh, middle classes, but are unwilling to actually tax the top of their own, own countries, but would rather derail globalization in the hope that the point B would go up. 
the, the, the situation has not really uh, changed for the middle and for the Western middle classes in the next period of five years. And it has not changed even for the following period up to 2018. The, the situation continued as before, with the one big ex exception is that the global financial crisis had a significant Im impact on the global top 1%. Um, just how significant it is, it is important to realize that one half of the global top 1% is composed of the top of the US distribution, simply because the United States is a very big country, it's a rich country, and it's fairly unequal country. So 11% of Americans are part of the global top 1%. And the top of the US income distribution, particularly the, the, the top 1% and the top second percentile, did not have good time during the global financial crisis. So that affected the numbers that you get at the global level. And in some extent, the global top 1% did not recover fully from the global financial crisis until COVID. Now, COVID is a different story. You know, the changes during the COVID period were very idiosyncratic. And so I will not discuss them. Uh, so essentially, we have these two periods of globalization, the one which I already explained, which actually both I explained. The first one was the elephant chart. The second one was very similar uh, for the points uh, A and B, but very different for the top 1%. So what was then I will then skip this part, which explains what happened at the bottom of the income distribution, where basically China vacated the very bottom of the income distribution and made uh, people mostly from the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, uh, fall into that lowest uh, decile, uh, which paradoxically then meant that actually there was an improvement position of the lowest decile. It's kind of difficult at first time to understand. It took, you know, it's what happened is that the poorest people who were in China, and there were quite a few of them, through growth and especially through this last attempt to eliminate rural poverty in China, they were actually pushed out of the bottom uh, decile. Well, that meant that people who were above the bottom decile fell into the bottom decile, but they fell into the bottom decile while keeping their previous incomes. So consequently, when we measure the income of the bottom decile, we see an improvement there. But you know, you, it's a peculiar improvement. It is simply the change in the composition. But what China also did accomplish is that it actually reduced, uh, as I mentioned before, it actually had a very strong effect on relative positions of lower Western income deciles. So on the left, you have a graph which shows you uh, the positions of the Chinese urban deciles in 88 and in 2018. Now, uh, every, of course, Chinese decile went up in the global income position, which is shown at the vertical axis. It's actually global percentile. Let's suppose you take the Chinese uh, fifth urban decile. Well, in 1988, it was around the 40th global percentile. So it was below the global median. Well, in 2018, it is at the 65th global percentile, so significantly above the global median. Okay, that's no surprise. We know that China grew very strongly. And of course, everybody, whatever decile in China it was, it actually went up. Particularly, it went up at the very top. You notice at the very top, actually, the gap is very large. So in other words, you have the top urban decile in China, which on average is now at the 97th percentile in the world. Now, when this happened, as I was saying in the very beginning, positions of some other people had to go down. And whose positions went down? You look at, for example, Italy, which is really a very good example of a country that has not grown in 20 years. So what happened is that lowers Italian deciles went down very significantly because they were in the range where they were overtaken not only by China, but also by other Asian countries. So notice the bottom Italian decile, you know, dropping from 75th global percentile to the 55th global percentile. Very significant drop. Although the real income of the bottom in Italy remained the same, 
But if the world is, is increasing at the rate of five, or particularly Asia is increasing at the rates of 6% per annum per person, if you don't grow, you actually are going to drop, relatively speaking, to the rest of the world. And that particular pattern is shown in all the rich countries. You know, uh, here you can see it for, I think, uh, Germany. I cannot read the title, but I think Germany is on the left. Uh, and uh, well, it's strange that I cannot see the titles. Ah, oh, because they're covered. And then Poland is interesting because you see Poland was really the most successful, is the most successful uh, so-called transition country with increased position of the upper part of the income distribution, but a dec de declining position of the bottom part of the income distribution. And why is it the declining position? Simply because despite the fact that Poland has grown significantly, the, the lower part of the income distribution is again within the range of the incomes of China and India and others, where actually the large progress has been made and these people have also declined in uh, relative position. The country on the right here is Brazil and I took a different slide. I had a very similar slide for South Africa. And the interesting part here is the following. At the bottom at, in South Africa or Brazil, there is no change because these people were among the poorest people in the world in 1988 and 2008. So if you're at the bottom of the world, not much of a change for you, you stay there. But And there is not much change at the top either because if you're really sufficiently rich, you are still remaining at that position. You are not being displaced by, by others. But who is being displaced in countries like South Africa and Brazil are the middle groups, because again, they're within the range where Asia plays a significant role. So you can, of course, there, there are many other countries that they did that. You can actually ask the question, why does it matter if somebody is, let me see how many, uh, I think I should be closing this uh, in five minutes. Uh, why does it matter if somebody is really declining in the relative position? To some extent, you might not, well, many of us have no idea what is their uh, relative global position, but uh, there are certain goods that are internationally priced and that would gradually become less accessible to those people who have declined in relative position. You can imagine this could be the iPhones, this could be the, the World Cup, this would be the special concert. These would be goods. They are goods that are priced internationally. They are goods priced for the global elite and they would no longer be available to you. So the, the, the decline in a relative global uh, position uh, is something that you might not feel, but it is something that is real. Uh, however, that change in the composition did not affect, as they already implied, the top 1%. The top 1% stayed more or less as it was before, very heavily dominated by Western countries. We have about you know, 80% of the people there coming from, uh, from the rich world. Uh, you see the United States uh, has the top 12% from its country into the global top 1%, Luxembourg 14%, Switzerland 9% and so on. And uh, however, for the first time we have here on, if you look carefully, urban China, because Chinese data come for urban and rural areas separately, and we use two different PPPs, uh, urban China, appears now with something like 5% of the total number of people which are in the, in the uh, top 1%, um, top 5%, sorry. So the, actually the US, the US share is, as you can see, still overwhelming, 40% uh, Germany and Japan are very significant, but for the first time, China is significant too. India is still very small under 1%. So this is what uh, uh, what has really happened. And let me just conclude. This, these are things that are dealing with the, the, the challenges uh, which currently exist. But the question is actually, what will happen in the next uh, 20 years or 30 years to the extent that we can predict that? So I will finish with that. Uh, first, 
there is very probably increase the global inequality after 2020, not only because of, of COVID, but also because China is no longer the engine of global inequality reduction because it has become sufficiently rich that its further fast growth actually adds to global inequality because it grows fast and it creates large gaps between herself and many populous African countries. So if we really talk about uh, continued reduction in global inequality and convergence in this century, we really have to shift our attention from China to India and Africa. And uh, this is simply a graph showing you that basically when this line is under zero, it shows the China uh, effect of inequality reducing. That effect has now become really zero or even positive. So one has to forget about China as the engine of global inequality reduction. So that in turn means that we have to focus on the um, African countries. Let me just go to the Africa. In us, can Africa become a new China? Now, I'm not going to speak of Africa as, you know, there are 55 countries, but if one really focuses on large countries, that's where the action should take place because it would make a huge difference if you, uh, countries like Egypt, Ethiopia, South Africa, Congo, uh, Nigeria, uh, Tanzania grow because of the large number of people and because these are the countries that are expecting practically the only countries in the world uh, in, well, of Africa is the only continent in the world that expects uh, uh, high, I mean, high population growth or positive population growth. But if you look at the past, the past is not giving you too much ground for optimism. I did a very simple calculation. I said, can I find countries in Africa which have had five years of consecutive growth, which was at 5% per annum over the five years? So you find basically only, only one large country, and that's Ethiopia, which had 13 years of such growth. And now Ethiopia, as we know, is in the midst of another conflict and the civil war. So the, the picture is not particularly bright, but then uh, I want to sh show the last graph about Africa uh, is that uh, uh, I have to say that we were not, uh, the economists, were not particularly optimistic about Asia in the 1960s and the 70s. People thought Asia is overpopulated, technologically not advanced and so on, and we were wrong. So, you know, Africa might actually surprise us, might uh, be able to continue where China and India have come, so that actually inequality in the world uh, decreases, but one should not be complacent. The gaps between Africa and the core are very large, as you see here on this graph. Uh, only 1% of African population is above, has incomes, which are above the, the, the Western or the global North median income. So the gaps are, you know, as you can see, the median gaps are almost 13 times. And um, uh, not only catching up, but reducing these distances is uh, going to take time and uh, require a significant acceleration of growth rates in Africa. It requires also a uh, significant decline in equality, but you know, there, and I will, this is my last point, there we really are facing a conundrum. And the conundrum is the following. Uh, if you look at China, China started with very low level of inequality and had very high, uh, high growth for 40 years and inequality doubled. But Africa or African countries, large African countries, take Nigeria, South Africa, uh, in Ethiopia too, start already with high levels of inequality. So you cannot say, okay, we are going to improve and accelerate growth and let inequality rise because it is not sustainable. So the, the difficulties are then really compounded and they're also compounded by the effects of climate change. So let me stop here. I don't want to become too pessimistic, but I do think that actually the, the likelihood of us continuing on the path of convergence 
um, seem to me in light of the most recent development with globalization, climate change, uh, high population growth in Africa and so forth to be relatively slender. So let me, let me stop here. Sorry if it took a little bit longer and I'm really looking forward to your comments. That was uh, fantastic, Branko. Thank you for 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 taking us really through through a speedy but but highly effective tour through uh, the patterns of inequality <clears throat> across the globe from. Uh, from the years 1820 to, to now. So, so that was really interesting. And you've thrown up a number of really important questions around um, how we would think about, about uh, patterns of inequality uh, kind of going forward uh, from here. So we have about 45 minutes for a, for a uh, kind of set of Q&A and for us to share some thoughts and uh, kind of raise a few issues for, for, uh, for us to debate. And there's three, three ways in which we can, we can engage. The first is for me to now uh, kind of ask anyone who's online or else who's in the room who would like to ask a question or make a, a, a a, a comment to kind of indicate, and what we can do is, if you're online, we can we 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 can unmute you, and we can give you the uh, kind of opportunity to ask to ask your question, uh, or make the comment that you'd like to make uh, directly to the whole audience. While that is is going on, um, anyone who feels more com com uh, comfortable to ask their their kind of questions on the chat or on the Q and A session should feel free to do that, and we'll try to select a few of those questions, uh, kind of group them and uh, put them to Branko. So let's start with the uh, with the first. Part and check if there's anyone online who would, would like to ask to ask a question or share a thought with us. If you could just indicate by raising your hand, and we can we can then unmute you from here. Um, I'm not yet seeing any hands, so maybe let's. Go to the online online question. Uh, uh, Brento, let's start with uh, 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 with uh, uh, with the kind of question from uh, uh, Robert Mutzova, who asks: uh, To what extent has colonialism and imperialism um, and imperialism? Uh, 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 contributed to global inequality, particularly from the perspective of Africa? Uh, you want to... Well, this is an ex uh, excellent question. What, what I can contribute here, and I hope I'm contributing that, is to illustrate uh, that the 19th century was the century where these large gaps have been created. Uh, I cannot show, there is no sort of uh, way causally to show how colonialism and imperialism actually prevented the growth of countries that did colonialism. But the, the very fact that uh, gaps once originally created were such that enabled the stronger countries to control other countries and possibly, and actually, of course, this is among economic historians that the debate, uh, possibly to prevent their, uh, their 
technological change and, and the rise. I mean, obviously the, the, the example that many people quote is the industrialization of India. Uh, so I, I, I cannot, uh, based on the data that I have, I cannot prove the causality. I can just simply note that the 19th century was the century where these large gaps have been created. It coincided with, uh, with the century of colonialism. And that was the century where both forces of within inequality and between inequality were on the rise. Okay. Thank you. So we have a hand up from, uh, from Kwanele. Uh, I've lost the surname now, but we, so it's, it's uh, uh, we, we're uh, kind of about to unmute you. Uh, 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 from, so, so a, a kind of question. Thank you very much. And over to you, Panela. Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Prof. Look, um, I understand that maybe Africa has um, an opportunity to be an equalizing power in global uh, inequality, but if you look at if you are looking at African economies, um, they are still largely driven by extractivism. Uh, South Africa, for instance, remains a Western enclave, imperialist enclave, um, in which resources are extracted. Uh, but my question will be briefly. With the shift uh, in the global south, there is an understanding that um, the, glo the global south is agitating for a shift from the Western hegemony. Um, this is underscored by the emergence of um, BRICS. What does this mean for the prospects of growth for, for countries such as South Africa um, and Brazil? Um, the alignment with the likes of India and China in terms of growth, uh, but also um, following on a path uh, that will actually um, have an impact on inequality within the global south. Uh, of course, this question takes me further afield because it goes into more political arena, but you know, I'm willing to, to do that. So uh, in my opinion, the South, the global South, is now in a very unique and relatively strong position. L let me just explain why I mean that. Like if you go back 40 years, and I'm old enough to remember that, when you had, of course, the group of 77, when you have the attempt to have new economic international order, uh, the, the South was uh, producing 20% of the global GDP. Now, the South is producing more than 50% of the global GDP. Now, obviously, it's mostly like India, China, Indonesia, and so forth. But the power of the South has increased. And I think that power should be used uh, uh, smartly uh, to basically change some of the rules of the international economic order, including, for example, the role of the IMF, the voting power in the IMF and the World Bank, the, the role of the United Nations, the role of the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, that were all essentially based, obviously, from 1945, and then later with WTO, based on the issues that are of largest concern to the rich countries. I mean, I'll give you an example of intellectual property rights. That's clearly something that was of huge concern to the uh, north, it was much less for the others. So I think in that sense, I'm optimistic. I think this is the, the situation has now changed. The, the relative power has shifted in favor of the South and it is probably time to, to use it. Well, there's a, a, a kind of related question, Branko, from, uh, from Eduardo, uh, 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 I hope I'm, 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 that I'm pronouncing the surname properly. Uh, and the question is, uh, so your, your, kind of your talks sort of spoke about the rise of China and, and its effect on, on, on kind of changing global 
the levels of inequality. The question is, uh, the kind of question is, why did globe, why did globe, uh, why did globalization from the nineteen eighty to two thousand and eight? Uh, 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 favor Asia and not favor Africa. Um, and as we now enter a period of deglobalization, especially in the US, uh, do you expect global inequality to rise? Um, in other words, is globalization the only solution to global inequality? So a three-part question. Firstly, any thoughts on what why the, the 1980 to 2008 period favored Asia and not Africa? Do you think we're going to see rising inequality um, as, um, as we enter a period of deglobalization? And what does that mean for globalization um, as a process that? that sort of changes international global inequality? Okay, well, uh, these are difficult questions. I will be very brief on them. On the first one, I think it's, it's a huge question. I think that essentially what China did was on a grander scale, follow the developments that happened previously in the rest of Asia uh, with uh, uh, South Korea, Japan first and South Korea and Taiwan. So there was a certain geographical proximity they was learning from each other uh, that was not available in Africa. So in other words, uh, uh, China, maybe with hindsight now, seems to us to have done what one should could have expected given the similarity of conditions and geographical proximity. And actually the US willingness to start importing from China because uh, one forgets that the, the starting point of Chinese development was its rearrangement of the relations with the United States. If there was no rearrangement of, of the relations with the United States, uh, China probably would not have developed the way that it did. Um, the second point, I'm pessimistic on the continued globalization because of the fact that the US which was the main engine of globalization ideologically, has now sort of gone into a different direction and is influencing, of course, the countries that are its partners to, to some extent, deglobalize, uh, which I think is bad because I think that globalization was a force that led to also large increases in incomes and reduction in poverty and even reduction of inequality. And third point, can of course the same effects be realized even with much less globalization? Technically, yes, you, you don't need necessarily globalized market, but I think in practice it's, it's more difficult. And just to give you an example that you know much better than I, but the African Union and different African customs unions and all of that have not been very successful precisely because there is uh, no significant variety in what to export or to import. In other words, if you grow, you actually would like to sell something to somebody else and then buy something that you don't produce at home. Uh, the, the, the bright part, I think, in, in terms of African development, it seems to me, is the uh, leapfrogging in the new technologies, particularly linked with uh, information technology, where Africa is actually uh, just simply done what China has done as well. It's just leapfrog. So forget about one type of development, just go to the very next one. So that's a very, I think, favorable part of, the, of development. Uh, but I think in absence of globalization, uh, everything would be more difficult. And that makes me in part pessimistic about the, the, uh, the rest of the century. Great, Brenta, thank you. So let's take the kind of question from Zohab, but before I read out the question, just to, to kind of again stress, we would like 
to give people the opportunity to ask their kind of questions uh, 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 directly. So if you, you want to take that opportunity, please feel free to raise your hands and we'll, we'll then unmute you and allow you to ask the question. But in the meantime, let's, let's take the question. Uh, let's take the question from the head, uh, Khan, whose question to you, Branko, is what do you think South Africa and other uh, large African uh, uh, countries can do about inequality? Uh, kind of especially with uh, uh, kind of challenges like climate change, uh, the fact that we're starting with quite <laughs> Uh, with quite high uh, levels of inequality. So, first part of the question is, can any thoughts from you um, on what the large uh, countries in Africa can do? Uh, and then part B uh, is is uh, 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 is 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 there a likelihood that the Asian uh, kind of strategy could be uh, 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 kind of could be repeated in Africa. You know, on the first question, it would be obviously a presumption from me to kind of decide, I mean, say what uh, countries that I don't know well should do. But I think in the case of South Africa, I would really uh, see Brazil as a, how should I say, as a country to imitate or to learn from. Uh, Brazil, of course, as you know, Brazil and South Africa were uh, generally considered as the most unequal countries in the world. There are some exceptions, Guatemala, maybe Colombia, at some point Namibia. But these are very large countries. These are large countries that have many similarities in that sense, in terms of level of income, technological development. Both of them have sectors which are very technologically advanced, uh, racial uh, differences are also very present. And uh, uh, Brazil has been reasonably successful in uh, stopping the increase and even reversing the increase in inequality. And the role that was played by uh, generalized the transfers, as you know, which are cash transfers that are even non-conditional, uh, although it was not much money, but it did have an impact. So I would say, you know, Brazil seems to me a good example to, to, to emulate or at least find out what they have done. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? I, I just skipped my mind now. The, uh, the, mind. Part, the part B was uh, your thoughts on uh, the possibilities for African uh, 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 countries to, 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 to follow exactly the same model that the Asians do? Uh, I, I don't know. This is really, of course, a much more difficult question. Uh, I, I think that the underlying conditions are different. Uh, you know, China benefited, I may, forgot to say that, and of course, uh, Japan and uh, Korea, South Korea and Taiwan are from also a very educated labor force, and they benefited from the fact that population growth rates were actually slowing down. And as you know, China had a policy of 30 years of intentionally, voluntarily, I mean, not voluntarily from the individual point of view, but voluntarily from the government point of view, of slowing population growth rate down. So these are not, it seems to me, the conditions that are prevalent in, in Africa. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that Africa can uh, follow the, the Asian path easily. So I want to, And it would be bad form for me to not ask you the climate change change question, and I'm going to take the one that's uh, uh, come up from uh, 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 Petra uh, from Petra and uh, uh, who says that uh, that that climate change or climate uh, uh, 
uh, collapse uh, will kind of have a huge impact um, in the near future. Um, kind of how do you see it affecting the nature of growth uh, uh, kind of in the West? And if I can just tap onto that, a question about what you think climate change means for countries in the global south. So to link it to the pre to, to the previous question, Branko, the what what China successfully did was to was to use the industrialization process with uh, large and massive investments in uh, in in kind of energy to drive uh, to drive a process which kind of economists would would <laughs> would think of as a a pretty standard structural transformation of the process. China went from being a largely kind of rural agricultural economy to an urban uh, 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 kind of industrial economy. So it's the it's the classic example of structural transformation. What I think I think climate change does is to is is to close off that pathway. In the way that that the economics literature has certainly thought about the process of growth. So, what are your thoughts on how climate change is is likely to to kind of affect these growth processes, and what do you think the the markers are around what? what we need to think about in terms of, of kind of global income distribution. You know, my, uh, my views on that have changed in the last maybe three or four years. I was more optimistic, maybe being an economist, I was more optimistic on the ability to control to some extent, to a large extent, the climate change through the usual mechanism of subsidies and taxes. I still believe that it is important. But I've noticed two things in the last four or five years which make me more pessimistic. The first is that it seems that the climate change is the effects of the climate change are more dramatic and more sudden than we were expecting. Secondly, that they are also more variable in the sense that there are greater fluctuations and greater unpredictability. Secondary, second, um, for climate change to be addressed one way or another, even if it was not getting worse, you need international cooperation. I think we have to come to a conclusion that this international cooperation is not forthcoming. And not only that it's not forthcoming, it is, go it is likely to be even less forthcoming in the future given the current conditions in the world where basically you have an undeclared trade conflict between the US and China and also undeclared war between NATO and Russia. And then you have this idea of, which is now I think very strong, getting stronger in the US, of French shoring or basically the creation of trade blocks. So the question that then, then I ask, and that's why I'm pessimistic, if the changes are more dramatic and worse, and our, meaning the world's, ability and willingness to actually work on that jointly, because we know that we cannot work on the climate change individually, if that willingness is less, then what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that we are actually worse off in both terms in the actual objective changes that we are witnessing and in our ability to confront them or to address them. So that made me, I think, much more pessimistic. And actually my recent paper, I actually mentioned that. I'm not a specialist in climate change, but I've observed these two phenomena. And of course I've read that Africa would be especially badly hit because of the, its location and because it depends quite a lot on agriculture. So, you know, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, uh, I have moved from, a, how should I say, moderate 
uh, or careful, optimistic view to uh, much more strongly pessimistic. Right. Uh, thank you, Branko. Let's let's take the question around um, uh, the kind of question uh, the question around my um, the question around my uh, migration from selling um, um, Matthews. But before I do that, uh, kind of Branko, I've just realized from the chat that you. That you're still sharing your screen, and we can only see a small. Oh, part I see. Of okay. okay, let me do that. Okay, then, then, then we can. Let me close my. Uh huh. Okay. That's, I'm always that's... afraid of doing that because sometimes I close everything. So, ah, oh, now I can see the questions. Yes, yes. So, Kansel is asking about some issues of my of my. Of um, 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 migration, it's an area that you uh, uh, published in. She says. Uh, so, so the question is, what role is is my is um, um, migration kind of across countries playing in increasing and decreasing inequality? Any any thoughts thoughts on that? You know, I uh, uh, the question was asked, and actually I didn't do that work, but there are people who did asking the following question, like what would be in um, how much of what we observe, what I've shown you now about uh, inequality and recent changes in inequality, how much of that is due to the uh, differences in population growth rates? The answer is not much, actually. So, so far, that has not been in, uh, significant. Uh, variable, but I think it will become with really dramatic differences in the population growth rates between Africa and the rest of the world. Now, it could be that the African decline, and actually, if, if you look at historical numbers, the decline in fertility rates more or less follows what has happened uh, elsewhere, and so we might actually have a significant, you know, decline, but in, in fertility rates. But I think, despite all of that there will be still a positive growth in Africa. Now, what does it mean for migration is the following. I've shown you this graph which shows large differences between core median income, and of course with the means it's even greater, and African median income. Uh, and the, the physical distance, particularly between North Africa and Europe is really very small, quasi non-existent. These two shores of the Mediterranean have historically been really part of the same world. Uh, you don't need to know too much history that, that to know that uh, Rome and Egypt, uh, Greece, uh, Spain or Morocco have always been very closely related. But when the gaps in income are very large as they are now, uh, the advantages of migration are also great. You know, if you migrate and from, let's suppose, the, you know, 80th percentile in Morocco and you go and become only 20th percentile in France, you would still gain in terms of your real income. So uh, I think the forces of migration are uh, there. They cannot be stopped so long as the gap in incomes is so large. And then there is another po political problem. Europe clearly is unwilling or unable to increase its intake on migration, which would be in principle good both for Europe because it has a declining labor force and for Africa and for the reduction of global inequality. But again, political issues are there. And um, unfortunately, as I think, actually, I see we might even see much more of fortress Europe. I understand now that the, the French are considering a referendum on migration. Uh, and then, as you have seen already, the Nordic countries basically have closed the doors altogether to migration. So on that account, too, we do not see a sort of a, a very positive uh, development. So in other words, if you look at at developments 
in uh, exchange of goods, exchange in services, exchange in technology, exchange in ideas, and exchange in people. In none of them do you see really an improvement, or actually you see in all of them a sort of closing down. Let's uh, try to, to tackle the question from, from kind of Ibrahim Khalil Hassan. And I think Ibrahim's coming at the kind of issue very much from a South African point of view. His question is about whether you have any thoughts on uh, on policies to, to, to kind of improve inequality in context where the, the middle classes, whether we we define that in terms of the mean or the median, but whether where middle class incomes are actually pretty close to the uh, 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 poverty line, and and kind of South Africa would be a a a, 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 a kind of Good example where we have such high inequality that that kind of any views on what the middle is is actually a, a a a kind of income that is quite low. Any thoughts from you on what can be done in 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 sort of contexts like those, and do you have any thoughts on uh, on on kind of some of the suggestions? That have been made. So for, for example, the idea of a basic income graph. I, I really don't have much. As I said before, I think actually Latin American experience to me suggests that things can be done. You know, Latin America is the only continent in the 1990s uh, and early 2000s that has not had a further increase of inequality. Now, you can say they had already high levels. But for many of the countries, they actually had a decline. And even when you adjust, because people have adjusted on the account of uh, underreporting the top incomes and all of that, and you still have either a stable level, stable at high level, or a decline in the level. Uh, so I really cannot speak of individual policies for South Africa simply because I don't know the conditions well. But I think that Latin America is a place uh, that uh, that in that case is uh, uh, how should I say spreading internationally its knowledge about ability to control further increase of inequality at a very high level. You know, I don't think that that countries like Norway and Denmark are something that that South Africa can learn from. It, the conditions are entirely different. But Latin America, yes. And I see so now other questions on the screen, which I have not seen before. So, okay, anyone, ones of those that you want to deal with, Franco, feel free to. to, to there there was one question on that I just saw seconds ago uh, on uh, the use of PPPs. So, l let me explain that. You know, uh, you can basically use PPPs or you can use dollars at the uh, uh, at uh, uh, exchange rate. Uh, the advantage of PPPs is that in principle, it accounts for the real welfare of people, especially, so, I mean, especially important in poorer countries because the price level in poorer countries is lower. I mean, this is something which I don't think we have to sort of disagree greatly because we know that countries like Norway or Japan are extremely expensive for a given sort of even food or for any given goods. Now, uh, the PPPs themselves are the result of a largest uh, project that was ever conducted. Actually, that project is now being done every five years approximately uh, by the UN and the World Bank. And the, the project, what the project does is actually goes over a list of a thousand prices and then creates price indices. And these PPP exchange rates are then used instead of the exchange rate of the market exchange rates. So the gaps with market exchange rates would have been much larger, but I think they are not realistic in the sense that they don't adjust for the differences in the purchasing power. But the question was asked, can we have other indexes? 
Well, yes, we can. Obviously, I'm working and I presented everything today in terms of income. But obviously, you can have other things. Human Development Index includes, as you know, education, includes health. And the question mentioned uh, something, I don't know what it is, but it is a happy planet, I think, or maybe some ideas about happiness. I'm very skeptical about happiness. But, uh, but yes, education and health were uh, measurable things. They are, there have been studies on that. They have been used. The data are available. So we can actually do, and I think some people have done, for example, global inequality in education attainments, global inequality, uh, global inequality in health. Although I think more work should be done of, of the same nature that I do for income, should be very easily done for health because health varies by income category. So instead of having on the vertical axis income as I do have, you can still have percentiles like what I have them on a horizontal axis. And then you can have uh, 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 lev uh, life expectancy on the vertical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So anyway, so that was what I wanted to say about the, uh, the, the measurement and the indicator that I use. So, so there was a question from a, a colleague in Indonesia who was kind of raising the 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 kind of question from 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 his perspective uh, uh, that, that 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 what the Southeast Asian region has seen is a is 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 a sort of the the uh, dominance and the power grow of kind of of the Chinese of the China um, of the Chinese uh, 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 people uh, at 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 the expense of of um, nationals from the countries around uh, and and he raises similar kind of issues about segregation across the globe. For example, in the U.S., uh, 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 kind of on race, uh, kind of similarly in uh, in kind of South Africa, where uh, kind of questions of inequality are really driven by by race. Yeah, Any thoughts uh, on that, Franco? Well, I have not much to say about that. I understand that, and of course. You know, I worked, I remember actually when I was in World Bank, I worked uh, quite a lot on Malaysia. Because Malaysia is another example where you have essentially three groups, you know, Malays, Indians, and Chinese. The, the levels of income were different. Uh, the distribution was different and actually did that particular gap. Uh, for a while, actually, it was not even allowed to, uh, to, uh, to discuss that. And they were not even publishing in the household service that were not, they were publishing the data, but without an indication of uh, uh, racial or ethnic composition. That, that has changed. So uh, I do think that these are obviously issues. There are, as you said, they are in, in the US, uh, in South Africa, obviously so, in Brazil. It was now raised uh, in the question with respect to China and to Chinese. Of course, one has to distinguish in that question uh, between the Chinese who are Indonesian citizens and then the Chinese minority that has been there for a long time and the role of the Chinese companies that are now coming and investing in, in Indonesia. So these are obviously two different things. Um, but, uh, but yes, in principle, when there are large income gaps, average income gaps or median income gaps between the different communities, it contributes even sort of numerically to higher inequality. And it has obvious political implications. Uh, and obviously it's better not to have them, but you know, to reduce them is not easier. South Africa is actually a good example of that. But Benko, we've, we've come to the end of the time that we have. Before I move on to closure, I wanted to give you the opportunity to make any any uh, uh, final remarks from your side. Well, uh, I first I would like really to thank you for the invitation. When we talked about that, 
originally maybe a year ago. It was, uh, I was very pleased. I'm actually very honored to have been invited. As I said, actually, I do hope to come uh, physically, not only like this over the internet. And then I would like to thank everybody for questions. I'm actually, and comments, I'm quite open to uh, answering them by email. You can easily find me or you can find me on Twitter. So I will be very happy to, to stay in contact and you're quite welcome to use the, the slides. So thanks again first for coming. I, I see there are still people in the three digits present and it was really a great pleasure for me to be with you.